Hey, James, this is the White Monkey. Hey, well, uh, I'm glad to be part of uh, the Pallid Simeon Alliance once again. Yes, yes, yes. Man, that Coda and music always gets me um, riled up. I, I love that that uh, soundtrack. When I hear it, it sounds cool. Then I start thinking about that dude that sicked his two pit bulls on me at Sinclair Lane and Frankfurt Avenue one Saturday night. Because when that music starts in the movie, there's these pit bulls that are like going into this village to kill these people. So. Oh, right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. They kill Conan's dad, right? Yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. You know, hey, it's better than getting intubated in an old age home, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you just took a a long train ride. Yeah, yeah. And um, you're you do a lot of trains. I. I, I love trains. I prefer them over planes and boats. I hate boats um, and cars. Uh, but trains, I, I do quite enjoy. Um, share with anything. Share with us anything you'd like to share with, about your train adventures. Ah, well, I went from Saturday the 21st. I left Portland, Oregon, and then in the afternoon and then late Sunday, uh, late Sunday morning, the 22nd of April, I arrived in San Jose. And, uh, you know, that was the most apparent thing. Uh, the train, the passenger uh, volume is now 75% of pre-COVID. It's not completely recovered, but Amtrak's been doing what they can to try to you know encourage uh you know people to take the trains um the uh the interesting thing was that approximately half of the people on the train were symptomatically sick with respiratory issues every train car on all of the three trains that i took over the next week had at least one person that coughed constantly, one person that sneezed once a minute, 20, 30, 40 people that coughed intermittently, and a dozen people that would be blowing their nose a lot. This is behavior that one, two, three years ago would have had a lynch mob after you on the train for spreading the dread disease. I have never in my life been together with this many people who were respiratorily sick and highly symptomatic not even during flu season the percentage is similar to a doctor's office in the 90s during cold and flu season or an emergency room during cold and flu season that's how bad every train car was oregon california nevada utah denver nebraska iowa Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, and all the train stations. Now, the people that were sickest were wearing masks, maybe as a courtesy, you know, to keep from coughing on the rest of us. We were all totally breathing all the same microbes because just having one person broadcasting high volume sneezes every minute for 20 hours, I mean, you pretty much got full saturation on top of half the people coughing constantly. Uh, intermittently to constantly. Uh, the interesting thing is, is the demographic of the people that were sick. They were predominantly uh, Caucasian. They were predominantly educated class, whether they were millennial college graduates on vacation, on a skateboarding outing or bicycle hike, or whether they were, you know, boomer business people that were taking a retirement vacation. Uh, these were all college educated people. These were all Caucasians. And the women were sick compared to the men, two to one. And the very interesting thing is about half of the couples, when one person was very sick, which was usually a female, 
the other person seemed not to be symptomatic at all. It's like it wasn't even spreading. And uh, like the last person I sat next to, this young fat man uh, going from Chicago to Pittsburgh overnight, he was coughing, sneezing, and sniffling constantly. Uh, well, that was four, five, six days ago. I didn't get sick. That's good. So, uh, so it makes you wonder why all these people are so constantly sick uh, when I've never seen this before in my life. Uh, so uh, it'll be interesting to see if it holds true and, you know, train trips the rest of the year. But the, the most astonishing thing was just the fact that nobody made a big deal out of it. In fact, there was this one poor soul that coughed continuously for 20 hours when the viewing car, the Coastal Starlake, went down the coast. And my heart went out to this guy. He was miserable. And there was he even got upset when people offered him help. They were offering him cough remedies. One guy even went and bought him two shots of JD, which <laughs> cost $22 on yeah. the train. Because the, the uh, prices on... Everything that was five bucks is now seven fifty. Everything that was seven fifty is now ten fifty on the trains. Uh, you know, people were very symptom uh, sympathetic to these symptomatic people. They weren't going after them like they were during uh, the pandemic. So I'm wondering, since there's like no COVID in the news, is that the deal? Even though people are sicker than ever, there's no sickness because we're not told to believe there's sickness in the news. <laughs> That's what I thought was the eye-opening thing. Right. You know, so that was blanket on every train. That was the case. I was one of the few people, and I was recovering from a bad month-long case of bronchitis. Uh, but I'm not a cougher. It's one of the reasons why I get pneumonia easily, because I tend not to cough. But I was one of the few people that wasn't symptomatically sick. Even though on this first train, I was, I was like on my second day without antibiotics. I was just out of the woods on the bronchitis. So it gives you an idea of how all these people were sick. Initially, I thought it was because they were all coming from the Pacific Northwest and everybody there was sick, but it was really crappy weather. But then even coming out of California into Nevada and out of Denver into the East, it was the same thing. Most of the people were sick. 60% of the people were symptomatically sick. Um. I remember in some of your previous posts about the trains, you encountered a lot of Amish. I'm curious, did you encounter any Amish and were, were they sick, just like the rest of the population? Uh, okay, so the Amish population on the trains was one third uh, of what it had been during the pandemic. okay? Uh, they really took advantage of the trains not being packed with English and the train prices being down to get a lot of their education out of the way. A lot of these traveling Amish parties were big extended families going with a couple of their 20 year old sons who were getting agricultural certification at universities in Mexico. Okay. Oh, wow. That seems to have reduced some. Uh, there were, uh, there was a party of six, a party of four, a party of eight, a party of 12 which is kind of like normal pre-COVID Amish populations. None of these people were symptomatically sick. One interesting thing was, is myself and the Amish men were the only ones that waited for women to get onto the train. Okay. Uh, because all of the other normal Americans were uh, morbidly obese and were having a hard time standing for 10 minutes. Uh, so the American land whale was having a very hard time mobilizing from the station to the train. So my broken down old scrawny ass with a 50 pound rock and these young Amish guys, each carrying a whole lot of luggage for their wives, were like the only men that would stood and waited for the women to get on the train. And the young Amish men even helped the regular women pack their luggage onto the train while their men left them behind. Uh, <laughs> And got the best seats and started slurping down carbohydrates as soon as possible. The uh, uh, the uh, the difference in the Amish behavior is even greater because it, it, we're getting back to a vacationing normal traffic where it was 
during COVID, it was mostly economic dislocation traffic on the train. Now it's back to people on vacation. And the behavior of vacationing American men of all races, okay, other than Amish, on the train is now 100% feminized. All they do is gossip, complain, and worry about what they're going to eat and how good it is and how good it tastes and how good it just tasted and how good it's going to taste, okay? And they're all a lot fatter than they were. The Amish guys still look like, you know, 19th century Americans, uh, I would say the average man on this train was 50 to 70 pounds overweight for his age and had a real hard time walking. Any man over 50 needed canes or crutches or mobility devices. And there were so many morbidly obese fat women and immensely obese men that there were not enough shuttle carts to take them back and forth to the train. So they would stand like giant beached seals wailing and screaming for more red cap carts, which were routinely manned by tall, thin African-American men, which was just comical. These tall, thin African-American men standing up on these carts, toting just gaggles of these immensely fat, mostly pale, sometimes chocolate uh, land whales back and forth to train stations, which is just hilarious. You know? wow. Oh, my. Wow. So so that that was very interesting. And that might play into why a lot of these people are so sick. Almost all of them, even your men in their late 20s, early 20s, mid 20s, they're all 50 to 80 pounds overweight. Of course, some of them are big. It might be like me being 20 to 40 pounds overweight because, you know, these men are at least six feet tall and they're like real big land whale babies, particularly the millennials. Uh, So. Demographically, the Amish stand out even more as like the last vestigial humans on the trains now. But, yeah. you know, because the, the economically dislocated people before, they were like real people. Even like the scumbag Afghan refugees, were, they were real people. Uh, but now you're back to the normal American on vacation, and he's like not half the human being he was in 2019. Yeah. Yeah. Now... Do you, do you think the the sickness um, in any way is caused by the the you know the the magic potion for the shamdemic that we were all pressured into uh, getting? But, well, I can I can only guess from the train experience, but my personal experience with friends and family is that most of the people I know that get it are consistently sick with respiratory ailments, and at least five of the men have developed heart conditions out of the pool of people I know, which is a larger pool than normal. I know a lot of people. Uh, You know, I've many times been the only person, uh, you know, uh, in a room full of sick people that was not jabbed. You know, uh, so I I would guess that that's also, it, it seems to be, suggested by the demographics of the people that are sick because that pale you know educated and feminized demographic that's that's who was getting the potion like 90 percent and above okay so I'd say probably yeah and i witnessed i spent time with about 20 homeless insane people that was six and a half hours in san jose on a parking lot and it took me 6,000 words and three chapters to describe the experience. And none of those people, though they were homeless and eating out of trash cans, none of those people were symptomatically sick and they were living outside and they were of all races and they were 50, 50 male and female. And I mean, this was just one of the most insane experiences of my life. And, uh, I mean, I was almost moved to tears in one case, you know, I mean, it, it was just astonishing. I, uh, I've blown half a week of writing, just writing up this experience because I thought it was important. Uh, but anyhow, that, that's, uh, you that, that's share, kind of off topic. But the, well, do you uh, want to share that experience? Sure, we can, sure. we can later, like when we talk about train stations and stuff, sure. Because it also reflects a new thing, which is called the through bus. OK, so like when we get to like the three bus connection and the breakdown of the train timing, 
then we can talk about that because that's where it occurred. But, uh, you know, I didn't want to take it off topic with the illness, you know, uh, but that, uh, you know, so that's all borne out. Yeah. People that should be less healthy or more healthy. Uh, people that are, you know, that believe in the medical system are less healthy. Uh, it, it, it's just like you're at a glance read on this. Right. Masking is 10 percent in California inside and outside. It's gotten to the point where it doesn't matter if they're inside or outside. People that mask inside, mask outside. If they mask in a group, they mask alone. Uh, on the trains, as you go east, it goes down to 5 percent. Unless you're around Asians, Asians or Southwest Asians, you know, that'll take it back up to 10 percent. OK, OK. I noticed um, in uh, LAX and then in South Carolina when I was doing the plane trip, um, masking. Yeah, I would say you're correct. Is about masking is just about 10 percent. And I there was no mandatory masking at all that I experienced. Now, in, in the su Sunny Valley, I used her transit system once I got off the train. And uh, one of the main hubs is San Jose. Another one is, uh, I don't know, somewhere near El uh, Palo Alto is like the main central hub. The outer hub where all the other mass transit links up is in San Jose. On their buses, they say masks are highly recommended. Uh and on those buses, you got 10 percent masking. And as you go east, as you go away from areas where they still have active, highly recommended mass signage, it cuts in half to 5 percent. Interesting. Even uh, in California. Now, I've heard some people theorize that like masking was part of like a mass occult psyop. Um, like masking up your face and it messes with human interaction and especially kids and stuff, being able to like learn how to read um, facial signs and all this. And so is this like, do we go through some like death and rebirth thing where like they make you mask and now you take it off? You went through your social conditioning or like, I mean, do you, is there anything to that? Like masking as part of this, mass occult thing on us uh, you know in medieval renaissance italy and before that they had fun funeral masks in fact uh leonardo's teacher master rocchio that was one of his main gigs was making funeral masks for the wealthy dead and i actually think it was like a funerary mass cult uh that we were inducted into and for people who think it is was unsuccessful i would say that before the shamdemic nobody in america masked now depending on where you are five to ten percent of america masks everywhere all the time so you went from zero percent to five to ten percent of the population uh becoming hardcore maskers so we now have a percentage of our population who believe in masking to a greater degree than most American Christians by percentage uh, believe in Jesus Christ. <coughs> most professed Christians in America believe in their civic laws and social norms more than they believe in their savior. For instance, almost no Christians in America will conduct the sacrament in their church as Jesus Christ had it conducted at the Last Supper because they believe more highly in the civic values of America in which there is uh, no drinking without a license to serve alcohol and there was no drinking by minors. Almost all American Christians believe more strongly in their civic laws and their social norms than they do in Jesus Christ. Now, People that have been inducted into them, and that's irrefutable. No, nobody can go against that with me. You know, I have 100% ironclad proof. Every Christian listening to me knows this to be true because they go to these churches. Uh, the Mormons drink water. The Catholics watch the priests drink wine. They don't drink it. The Protestants drink grape juice. Okay. One, th one thing I want to say about the 
Catholicism because I, I used to attend Catholicism, uh, a Catholic mass until I gave up trying to be a Catholic. <laughs> but um, you nowadays, uh, you you can it, you you at least at least in California, okay, you the priest will share the cup with you the, of of wine, maybe pre Vatican II or something, or maybe in other places. Um, because I know every region Catholicism kind of can be different, but yeah, like I've definitely drank, have had the wine. Oh, cool. From, yeah. That was totally taboo in the East. Okay. okay. And it the might Catholic be a Vatican. Churches. Yeah. It might be a Vatican II pre or post thing. I don't know. And then another interesting thing is I, because I read that article you did on, um, the mass and, and the body and blood of Christ and stuff. And it's, yeah, it's quite interesting to compare everything. If you can, I would love to see you give your perspective on the Eastern Orthodox, because unlike the Ro- well, it's Roman, it's not something I know anything about. I've never been to one of their services. Oh, OK. Yeah. But they they um, they don't use the the they use leavened bread and not the actual like um, the the unleavened wafer. Well, I think that's authentic. If you think about it, it, you know, it's assumed that Christ was using the unleavened bread that the local women made. Well, so the Mormons used the leavened bread that the local women made, you know, so, you know, there's nothing to matter with that. That, uh, But if you look at your estimates for fundamentalist Christians in the United States run around 10 percent, you know, because. Fundamentalist Christians, I know many of them. To them, they're like the only real Christians, okay? Okay. Uh, yeah. You know, Catholics are not Christians and so on, uh, you know, and, and on points of doctrine. Uh, uh, many, uh, many Protestant denominations, uh, their membership in Christianity is based on points of doctrine. It's doctrinaire, all right? So, uh, but, but the point is, amongst fundamentalist Christians in the United States, uh, it's alcohol's taboo, yet it was part of the Last Supper. OK, so that's my point. You've got now the people who are dedicated to the mass call in this country have about the same numbers as dedicated fundamentalist Christians. And they believe in their call more than the Christians believe in theirs. I see. Because Christians do not even take Christ's example over their own civics for the most part. OK, you know, unless the church did it for him, which is what you're describing for Catholic churches in California. OK, where, you know, the church actually went a different route than the civics. You know, but no church back east breaks the taboos established by the local liquor board. I see. OK, OK. okay so okay. if you're talking about the success in building a call, this is as a percentage uh, some of your most successful recent cults in the United States, uh, uh, Mormons, Jehovah Witness, uh, the uh, Scientology. <laughs> OK, are any are any of these people five or 10 percent of the U.S. population? I no, I'm not sure. not even close. Uh, I mean, the Mormons might have a high percentage in Utah, Idaho and Wyoming. That's it. OK. They're like a half a percent at best nationwide. Um, you know, Scientologists don't even make up a percent. Scientology is like the most successful, very recent call over the last 50 years. And they don't even mark a percentage point on the scale. But the mask call is, has already exceeded nationally the membership that the Church of Jesus Christ in Latter day States and the United Jewish Synagogues has. As far as the percentage of the population in this country. So I would just point that out that this has been a glowing success. And if you look at it just in terms of medical politics of the future, which are going to have already been put into privatized, put in privatized hands. What did libertarians always say? And libertarians were actually right about what happened with the shandemic. They they predicted this shit a long time ago. Ethically, I don't agree with. Them. But libertarians always said if you want to effective civic governance you had to privatize it well that's what the government has just done with all their medical uh 
uh, edicts. They have now privatized them. They've thrown them to the private medical establishment. So you actually you're headed towards corporate governance on a libertarian model. But instead of representing a sovereign citizen, it's representing a sovereign corporation. Right. You know, so this is a huge ominous thing. You've got a ground floor base, hard floor, hard floor of 5% dedicated mass cultists in this country. That's when, when you figure people were just about to get lynched over not wearing a mask in public. Uh, when you went from zero to half of everybody masking, imagine when you go from 5% with another 50% accepting of masking under mandated conditions and pretty much believing in the economy and that companies are as important as the government. A lot of liberal people are now have now gathered and come together with conservatives, not in politics, but in their belief that private solutions by companies, particularly medical companies, are valid. You know, so there's starting to be an agreement, you know, more and more Liberal lefty people will talk to me about economic solutions, economic incentives, and how important it is to make a profit. Okay, even in the context of healthcare, uh, you know, because it's all part of liberalism. Because conservatives are part of liberalism too, you know. So I think you have with that five percent hard four of mass cultists, and then your fifty percent of people that are willing to mask without complaint under mandated conditions, which means to them rational, which means media pronouncements. Right. And any private corporation that puts out uh, their own demand on masking, well, that's really regarded as internally sovereign. That company is supposed to be able to allow to mandate its own conditions in its, in its own workplace and its own corporate space. So I think you're you've got a great ground for for the next time uh, the powers that be decide that masking is the good idea for whatever reason it's for. Well, do you think um, I mean, they're going to do you think they might go back to masking and then another step forward? I don't I don't know. Maybe you have to put gloves on uh, plastic gloves now on your hands or I or like wear one of those white suits (laughs) suits <laughs> i mean do you think they're going to try to push the envelope even more well that's round? already happened in the workplace uh th- these new th- additional things like that are going to come from the corporate sector be- not from the government this has been handed over from the government to the private sector and if you think about it the whole shamdemic was the way where the private sector of the medical industrial complex co-opted the governments of the world to uh, to sell their product, even under duress, to actually demand that their product be purchased. It's okay. Okay, so it, it's it's a natural feedback loop. You know, this was initiated by the private sector using government as a vector to capture uh, human population and put them under direct medical supervision. And then it's going to loop back to them. I wrote about this in a novel called Beyond Rainbow Bridge a couple years ago, you know, midway through the shamdemic, okay, where, uh, you know, I postulate, you know, 20, 30 years in the future, there's going to be, uh, there's going to be another round of this and that uh, acute respiratory distress is going to be caused for euthanasia in children and the children's body parts are going to be used to as life extension therapy for the for the super elite and that the children will be given i think this is where we're going with the rights of children to seek medical care without the intercession of their parents which is part of the whole transsexual thing because it's going to be a way where children will be able to see an advertisement about going beyond rainbow bridge to join you know their grandpa and their grandma and everything when they're sick and then they'll be able to sign their life away to a medical corporation without parental uh you know agreement uh, i think that's where this all goes in the end as part of the medical uh complex that, it, you know so that makes perfect sense actually i i didn't 
I didn't see that, I didn't, but that actually makes perfect sense. So I mean, subtitle is The Curious Afterlife of Dandelion Mackey. Uh, <laughs> the title is Beyond Rainbow Bridge, and the protagonist is my roommate right now. Uh, he's a fanatical bodybuilder. Uh, oh, cool. Who, uh, I have him as the last non-vaxxed person, you know, is you know fighting a crusade to, to rescue some girl from the medical industrial complex, you know. Okay. That's cool. Is, is he the guy that that was helps you with the dieting and he has like a pet parrot? Oh yeah, yeah. And the parrot is actually makes it into the novel. Uh, oh, that's cool. You know, so uh, yeah, he's the guy that helps me was what thirty and uh, 50, 80 pounds. He's helped me lose eighty pounds. Yeah, that's eight. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so, so anyhow, that yeah, the the masking is uh, uh, it, it's not going away, you know. But the the people, particularly conservatives, are so brainwashed. When they see most people not masking, they're like, oh, it didn't work. It was a failed op, and now everybody's back to their senses except for these few crazies, and they don't understand how cults are developed. They don't understand that they have just witnessed and then ignored. Uh, the birth of a new cult that's going to control portions of their life in the future. And they don't understand that half of their fellows are going to turn on them in a heartbeat in the future and break the masks back out. Okay. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. I, um, I wanted to, you've talked a little bit about, um, uh, slavery, um, white slavery in the Middle East, and then there's like um, that castration, right? They would have castration; it kills like something like eight out of ten boys, right? Um, I think and, the number was ninety oh, percent okay. in uh, uh, in medieval Egypt. You know, so I don't know enough to make a blanket statement, but it was in a uh, it was in a book by Raya Tannehill titled Flesh and Blood, A History of the Cannibal Complex. And you uh, or it was in her book, Sex in History. I think it was in Sex and History. Flesh and Blood was an outtake that Random House wouldn't publish. So she published it through Dorset. But I used those two books and the information on castration and sex and history to write uh the novel the jericho bone which was about the famine in egypt of 1201 and okay. which i described graphically the castration process do, do you think like i mean i definitely th think the whole euthanizing the kids to harvest them and stuff is absolutely true and like i i, I believe i mean whether or not anyone agrees with abortion or not i i pretty much i mean i think that's what they're doing a lot with the aborted babies but uh, do you think a side uh benefit uh for the elites like um they want to castrate these uh boys they want to like you know and uh, make them more feminine um so they and then also so they um they won't breed that'll lower the population and two they have more boys to bugger <laughs> right well sure okay so uh, uh, briefly with the castration in North African slavery, uh, bishops and cardinals of the Catholic Church in Venice did a regular traffic in castrated Englishmen sold to the Turks as eunuchs and sex slaves. OK, this was around 1300 uh, to uh, 1600 uh, A.D., and these men only had their testicles taken off. It was common only to take the testicles off. But there was a scandal amongst Jewish women and men in Egypt in which wealthy Jewish matrons were getting castrated African men as slaves and having sex with them because these guys, some of them were still able to get an erection with their balls cut off. So it then became decreed under, you know, uh, role in Egypt that uh, and became 
across the Arab world, it became standard that when you castrated African boys, meaning uh, Bantu boys, sub-Saharan African boys, that you would take the testicles and the penis. This caused a 90 percent death rate and uh, a goose quill or some other implement was required to depress the urethra to permit this person to urinate. So I had my character, Abdal Latif, who was the real historical doctor who documented the famine in the Jericho bone. I had him gift the one that boy that survived a mass botched execution, uh, mass bo botched uh, uh, castration, which turned out to be an execution. I had him gift the one surviving boy his own inkwell for this purpose in hopes that he would actually survive and be able to urinate. Uh, so. This explains why almost 100 million Africans were required for the slave trade across the Sahara into the Middle East and North Africa, because 90 percent of the males died during the castration process, not to mention how many died marching across the Sahara behind the camels. And this is compared to uh, uh, some uh, 10 million being shipped across the Atlantic, of which. Eight million went to Brazil, you know, uh, one million went to the Caribbean and less than a million were shipped to North America. OK, uh, so of the 100 million, 80, 90 million are, are going to the Middle East to, you know, fill in this basic popula vast population sink caused by castration. Wow. Now, the. Uh, uh, that t just taking the testicles off of the European man was thought by Middle Eastern and Turkish men to make them very sexy and attractive and and, and desirable for having sex with. Now, the uh, uh, well, before we get off the slave subject, I'd just like to announce that Lynn Lockhart has published in hardback, a I think a 240 page book a historical novel of Plantation America titled Cox and Swain, two <laughs> sons of an utterless whore, U-D-D-E-R-L-E-S-S, -S, the utterless whore that does not nurse her children, being England or Great Britain. Uh, and it's about two, uh, two uh, kidnapped boys from the London area of England being sold into servitude alongside the historical poet and English slave George Alsop, who I assign as their fictional biographer. He was a real guy that wrote a real poem and a real account. And I slide these two characters in as uh, members of the transports. He would have been accompanied by 60 such young lads. There's no record of who they were, you know, he refers to them in the aggregate. So I made these two characters at a request of my roommate. OK, and he wanted to see me write a novel, of Plantation America, in which he and I would be shipped off in shackles together. And he wanted me to use as the trope. How would you and I, if we were younger teenagers or older preteens, how would we band together for our own survival and make sure we didn't get raped on the slave ship? Th that's uh, the adult criminals that were being shipped along. So that was like the plot he handed. That's me. cool. And 120 pages of this novel are actually historic notes, including uh, consisting of historical material concerning European slavery in the state of Maryland between 15, between 1634 and 1678. And the novel is placed in 1655 to 1659. So all the historical notes in the background are of Maryland, where the novel is set, and of the period in which it is set. In. And that's uh, that's on sale now. There's a there's an article for it with a with a hard link, uh, you know, on the main site on jamesafun.com. Are there um, is there an ebook version of it or can we? No. OK, now there there won't be until probably the end of the year. My uh, my webmaster will make an ebook. So with these books that Wynn does in hardback about six months or a year later, 
my webmaster will take her file and he'll make an ebook out of it. Okay. Cool. Okay, so so that uh, because the ebooks just get pirated, you know, we're not part of like a Kindle system or something. So okay. as soon as I send one to somebody, it gets put up for free on some platform, and then she won't sell any books. You know, because most people read ebooks now. Right. No, yeah. So different. it's one way to try yeah. to make sure that we sell at least ten books before it gets stolen. You know, by our <laughs> readership. Right. You know. I hear you. Yeah. So it's a temporary, you know, exclusive. Uh, you know, I mean, there's one fellow that sends me a, a generous donation every month. Every month I send him the book I completed that month. So, you know. Uh, OK, cool. You know, so but he's a man of means. He doesn't have to pirate my material, you know, like most of my readers, uh, you know. So. It, uh, but that was the uh, um, that that was like the color castration was really under the slave master matrix for most of history so it's interesting that castration is now coming back as a voluntary thing that people are clamoring for and i would uh i would point out that on my recent series of train trips i did not board a train that was not inhabited by mated pairs of homos lesbians and trannies and uh the pre-covid vacate so we're returning to the trains being used for vacationing. The secondary purpose of trains has generally been grandmothers visiting their their scattered family and visiting their grandchildren and then coming back. Uh, during COVID, it was for economic dislocation, people like me. Now, as it returns to vacationing, uh, there's a much reduced returning population of married boomer pairs. And older Gen X pairs. There's not many of them, but there some of them are returning. That's mostly what you see in the sleeper cars. All of the vacationing couples under 40 years old, and not all, most. Most of these are either homos, lesbians, or trannies. And what's interesting is the priority seating on priority service on Amtrak is sleepers one, business two coach last amongst the coach herd pri priority seating is families first pairs second and individuals last amongst individuals it's women first uh, uh, people of color second uh, <laughs> men without color last this is the declared and enforce priority seating on Amtrak, at which I've been subject to. The uh, interesting thing is, since traveling couples, it, let's say you get on a train at the head of the line, they don't bother giving you assigned seats. Once you picked out a seat, they'll come by and they'll note where you have seated yourself, and they'll give you a seat slip, and they'll number it, and then they'll make a seat slip for the empty seat next to you, and they'll give that to somebody that's about to board, like, at the next stop, so they have a place to sit. Now, if a couple boards, and you and I are both seating, we both have window seats and separate sets of seats, they'll make us buddy up so that the couple can sit together. So what happens now, when you're on a train as an individual traveler, you will routinely be bumped by pairs of mated homos, trannies, lesbos, and people of color. Oh, wow. So like the lone traveling guy like me, you know, a young couple of color needs a seat, I get bumped. Okay. The person next to me moves, and then a pair of two flaming homos get on, and they want a spoon and pet. <laughs> I get bumped. You know. <laughs> Uh, so and I've I've been seated behind, across from, and in yeah. front of, like these trainees and homos making love and petting and spooning on the train, you know. Uh, so nobody ever says get a room. So that that's kind of interesting. Uh, so the traveling business, uh, th there are some traveling business people. They're they're a minority, like the economic dislocation people, because business people tend to take points. So. The vacationing middle class person of the future is already there. They are transsexuals, homos and lesbos, 
And the funny thing is, is I was on here with numerous trannies and I was seated next to one. He broke out an entire backpack of pharmaceutical bottles, prescription bottles, <laughs> and took a whole cocktail of this stuff right next to him. Him and his friends were talking. And, you know, I've lived downstairs from flaming homos that are having screaming arguments about who sucked more hundreds of dicks, right, than the other one. It's pretty disgusting. But you know what was even more disgusting was listening to these guys not talk about sexual conquests or sexual deviance, but talking about how alienated they feel, how at what color their new cat is, uh, how, how they relate so much with their middle aged single mother now, how they're now a cat man, how they're now a dog parent, uh, how they are uh, wondering where they'll fit in and is. Uh, What cities are most mass transit friendly, trans friendly, gay friendly, queer friendly? Because it turns out these people are taking so many drugs, they can't drive. They have to take mass transit. Okay, so they they were talking about making the circuit, Denver, Chicago, Seattle, San Francisco. This is where they go to like all their events. It was like anime and role playing and and dress up and 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 plushy conventions and stuff like that. And. uh, these guys were not like flaming homos. They were just emasculated. They didn't even behave like sexual beings. They all had a strong lisp. But, and, and the you medicine know, you think? I, I don't Do know. You know I just don't know. Now, women my age and older have traditionally been fag hags. They love hanging around with homos. But I got to tell you, the women on this train, older than me and my age and a generation younger than me, they were disgusted and disturbed by these guys and and actually uh, used me as kind of like a block between them. I was used to like get away from one of these guys. Not that they were being harassing because these guys weren't able to talk to people outside of their community, their psychological community. Okay. Uh, It was just disturbing to be around people that were this mentally fragile and open about it in public and just totally into life as therapy. Wow. Yeah, so um, that, do you, it was do you, just strange. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it does seem like um, some people in the gay in the gay community or like the feminist community will um, are anti trans the trans community for some reason. Like, you know, they don't These have a problem with sodomy, but but if these guys on a train, there was total of them. They were mixed. Okay, some okay. Of, it was homos hanging out with trannies. And, of course, these were all younger, too. I could see, okay. like, the older gay and lesbian people being really pissed off about their young lovers getting their junk cut off. <laughs> young lovers, yeah. well, getting their junk cut off, okay? Right. I, I could understand that. Okay. But when I'm seeing, like, the spooning homos, like, Bow, you know, uh, pal palling uh, in the viewing car with like uh, the wisping trannies and like all making common calls. They're all in their 20s. Yeah. Oh, my. Oh, my. Um, that was. Yeah. And it, now there's a lot of mental sickness out there on the trains now a lot more than before they starting with covid you'd always have one in sano on every car now you've got two uh the um before that there was none uh but they're not all these trainees and homos most of them are just nor like normally like crazy people just totally alienated people uh, and there was a lot of heterosexual insanity uh, particularly at the Diridon San Jose Transit Center, uh, in which I could have had a homeless wife three times in one hour. Three <laughs> different homeless wives offered themselves up to me. Yeah. As the apex homeless guy. I was the cleanest homeless guy. I had the best rucksack. Uh, I, I picked out the best spot, and the other homeless guys um, keep it. So I was, like, sitting on the throne. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, do you I mean, do you want to go into that eight hour experience? Or uh, do you, sure, sure. I would, yeah, I'd, I'd be quite fascinated. Um, uh, I, by I, the way, I, yeah. the, the local mass transit in Portland, Oregon, nicest bus drivers in the world, very helpful, clean buses. San Jose, nicest bus drivers in the world. I'm used to bus drivers that look at you like they want to stab you in the throat as soon as you ask them a question, a simple question. OK, and they usually won't answer your question. These bus drivers in San Jose are of the same race as those bus drivers in Maryland, and they're nice as could be. One guy even gave me a free ride around town. Uh, one guy of my own race picked me up and gave me like a free tour of time and went a free tour of town and wished me luck because he saw my rig and he knew I was traveling and homeless and trying not to be a pest. Right. Uh, so these were great guys. Uh, now, those buses stop delivering people to the Deeradon station uh, between 10 and midnight. So I need to get there between 10 and midnight. I get there at 1030. The, uh, um, it's within sight of the airport. You can see the planes lifting off. Uh, at The Amtrak station closes at 10. So you got to be out of that building. Then they have uh, a, a roofed-in area that's gated that's open to the tunnel under the train track that goes to the Caltrans stop. The Caltrans train stopped running at midnight. And then they lock that gated area up and the engineers work on the trains in the train yard that's behind these big iron bars. And the whole time there's this black rabbit with big black bunny ears grazing on the weeds, like between the train tracks. Well, uh, as soon there was some big Spanish party with like rich young people with cars that had happened around here and that was breaking up. And some of them were like walking to the trains and the, and the last buses. And then they clear out after they clear out, people start coming out of the shadows with their baggage and they spread out and they camp under each one of these many bus shelters, which are numbered. It's like every bus that goes through this valley stops at this Deardon station and turns around here and they have a nice bus shelter, you know, the hollow rectangular aluminum bus shelter. And then there's the three bus shelters for the through buses. So this isn't the Greyhound bus. Uh, there's been so much trouble with trains being overdue over the past couple of years because of the heavy freight traffic that uh, Amtrak has contracted. They have new management and the guy's apparently very aggressive. I sat near a guy that writes uh, uh, that writes for a railroad magazine that told me about some of this stuff. Uh, these through buses are these really cool Volvo buses with a weird shock system and tinted windows, and they're very quiet. Uh, and they are used to chase down trains uh, to get to a train stop before a train that pulled off one time after another train came late and then link up. And they've also been used to reduce uh train stops by doing the same thing like cutting between major train hubs so instead of taking the train from san jose to emeryville to get the train from emeryville to chicago i'm assigned a through bus uh essentially for free uh to emeryville through san francisco from san jose it doesn't come until 4 30 in the morning so I've got from 10.30 to 4.30 to wait for this thing. By 11.30, we've got 14 people camping out on this parking lot. They're keeping their space. Uh, there's, uh, there's young Jemima. One day she's going to look like Aunt Jemima. For now, she's kind of cute and a little bit pleasingly overweight, flowery dress, scarves, you know, picked out hair, half an afro, you know. Uh, she uh, she uh, asked me for a smoke, and when I didn't have one, and it, this is a common affliction of all the homeless people in California. They all have something to smoke, and none of them have a white source. Oh. Somehow they have a reefer or a blunt or a cigarette, but they don't have a lighter or, or a match. I mean, it's like a universal affliction of these people, okay? Uh, this was the whole night was these people trying to get lights. Well, she wanted me to sit next to her, and I did not. So she calls over. There's this tall black guy standing next to me. It looks like an old school, you know, like 
trying not to be homeless, semi-criminal black dude who's showing me plenty of respect. I nod to him. He gives me space. I've got the only wooden bench, which is kind of nice because I lost my windbreaker. And all I had on was my hoodie. And um, she asks him for light. He doesn't have one. She calls him over to sit next to her. And then she grabs his hand. She stands up and she leads him over to the first through bus shelter, which is a bigger shelter than the regular ones next to where this big homeless black dude with dreadlocks and neon tennis shoes is sleeping on the sidewalk under his sheets and blankets. And he starts to moan and groan. And I see his feet kicking out from behind the shelter and they start to, to twitch and scissor and shake and stuff like that. And then I hear him moan as if he's being stabbed to death. Huh. And in silence and his feet shake to a standstill. And then she leaves the shelter, wiping her mouth with the back of her hand, and she goes over to this trash can, and she gets a plate that a young Latina had been eating off of that left there. And she picks up the plate and the fork that was still there and starts eating off of it. And she goes back to the sidewalk, and then her boy, her new boyfriend comes out. To It was like this art deco concrete, and they sit on this, and they just sit there. Okay. So this is the kind of stuff that goes on all night, like these different people having interactions. Can, can I stop you real quick? Sure. I, just so I understand what's going on. Did that, that, uh, that black guy that was showing you respect and stuff, he, did he, so he was led over by the, the black homeless lady and he possibly stabbed that guy? It sounded like he was being stabbed, but I think what was happening was uh, he was being dominated orally. Okay. She was imitating Orpheus and his, you know, Okay. Uh, I, th- oh, I, I was like, I wow, see. because I couldn't see in the shelter. All I could see was his feet. But after she walked out from under the shelter, wiping off her mouth with the oh, back I of his hand, he then followed her perfectly healthy. If seeming a little bit drained of energy. Okay. 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 He's about 60 years old. She's about 25. So okay. this was the fate she apparently was offering me. Okay. Um, uh, some sort of like common law wedding under the bus shelf. Right. Right. Uh, after this happens, a homeless woman with a pet dog who's keeping herself clean, petite 35 year old woman, uh, with the dog on a pink leash. It's a golden retriever and it's got a pink scarf around its neck and she's got wheelie luggage. She looks like she could be a legit Amtrak ticketed passenger. And at this station, these are the least dangerous, by percentage, most often female and most often handicapped homeless people I've seen on the Pacific Coast. These people would not survive in Emeryville, Oakland, Portland, Seattle. And so when they come around to the station, they don't come out and inhabit the shelters until after the buses start running. And at 430 in the morning, they start cleaning up their shit and go. They don't make themselves a problem, and they like to hang around around the train station, so they make sure they look like Amtrak passengers. And you know what? Maybe they sometimes are, and maybe they once were, and they got stuck. Okay? Uh, This lady looks at me. I got the nicest bench, and she says, sir, may I share this bench with you? So I said, yeah. She sits next to me. She wants to curl up next to me and starts talking to me. And she asked me a question about something that was going on. I said, I don't know, miss. I'm just passing through. And then she went. She seemed hurt. She sat there for a little bit. She picked up her stuff. She moved to a less comfortable steel bench that doubles as a bicycle rack. And she curls up with her dog there. Okay. This was an attempted wedding. She's looking for a protector. Okay. okay. Just like, a, you know, a woman on the frontier who has no husband and the next dangerous dude needs to be the husband because... You know, she can't protect herself about against saying these guys, her dog and her dog checked me out first. She didn't talk to me until her dog sniffed me and then wanted to spend more time with me. And I'm like a messenger for dogs around the country because they I, I oil my boots up and then they can all smell each other through my boots. So they all communicate through my boots so <laughs> dogs across the country. Like use me as like a telegraph line. <laughs> I'll know each other through my boots. Well, uh this, this is uh, interesting because we'll, we'll, this reminds me of something you said once, like a couple of years ago. Uh, you said, um, 
as the economy crashes, pussy is going to get cheaper. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, it has. It has. <laughs> you know, well, then there's Black Tina. She's got a pink pullover over top of blue jeans. She's got no luggage. And for six hours, she's asking for a light from different people. And she can't ever remember she asked, she asked you for a light. OK, now. A woman shows up who at first I thought she was maybe a female version of me, a writer that lived locally or possibly a university anthropologist. Because she had a business trench coat on. She wore a black suit dress underneath of it. She was light skinned African-American. She had nice straightened hair. She kept herself well. She had a normal size purse and she had a manila folder with tad manila envelopes sticking out of it which she held in an official in a in in an officious posture as almost as if she was taking a survey at a shopping mall interesting and she just stood around <laughs> and, uh and i was like wow well i wonder if she's waiting until 4 30 in the morning too maybe she's going into her job you know in san francisco or something i don't know this is quite strange well some woman who used to be hot but is not because her voice is so wrecked comes across the parking lot asking if anybody's seen her husband in a red like 74 mustang okay this chick is built good she's almost pretty still cute 35 tan blonde but her voice is so wrecked from whatever she smoked that she can't possibly be desirable OK, it's like your grandfather's chain smoking voice got put into this bitch. All right. So she comes up there and uh, at the the central person is uh, uh, what, what did I call her? Manila Trench. OK, the, the, the bus stop anthropologist <laughs> standing there, not really talking to anybody, but she is giving lights to people that need lights. By the way, the uh, the uh, young Jemima got a light from Shirthead, who was one of two Wiggers there. This is the blonde, blue-eyed Wigger who ha- is wearing a wife beater and has another wife beater ra- wrapped around his head, who did not want a blowjob from this bitch. He said, I'll give you a light, but I'm not going to go with you. Okay. okay. I got a car to detail at 1.30 in the morning. Uh, go figure, you know, at this public place. So... Uh, and in the distance, you could always see the lights of a police car, but it never comes to the facility. And people occasionally look at it, including me. Um, now, there's also a tall Viking bitch who stands. She's got the main bus stop in the middle, which I used to get here once. Reclining at her feet on the concrete above the asphalt is her man smoking a, a glass pipe continuously for six hours it looks like a little psychedelic campfire wow now when this horse horse sounding cutie comes by looking for her husband in a 74 red mustang the viking bitch says go around bitch okay and she does okay because this chick I, i would not want to deal with this like 35 year old six foot tall blonde bitch and a wife beater who's standing protectively over her male property, who's doing nothing but getting stoned, right? Wow. So this is one dangerous bitch. Then there's young Jemima, who I was really weary of her because she's like 5'7", 240, 25 years old, kind of little waist. I mean, so she's got a lot of hips and shoulders, so she's strong. Yeah. It's, you know, it's like it's that still healthy overweight build like the chick that west african body type that was designed to carry a lot of weight uh okay so uh you got these two alpha bitches are basically staked out their territory even the neon giant sleeping on the sidewalk you know isn't coming around these chicks and then there's another wigger who's obviously jealous of kid rock and he's occasionally chanting threatening stuff from down past uh, the big neon sneakered guy. Okay. And at, at one point, young Jemima yells at him, calls him a bitch. 
okay, and tells him that us real bitches is running shit up in here. And <laughs> if, if he wants any action, he's going to have to go across the street. You're going to go across the street, yeah, and find you a homo. <laughs> Okay, so like the pussy's monopolizing the pussy. It's really it's really funny, you know, so and 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 you know what? This girl and the Viking chick showed all respect to this petite little homeless 35 year old woman. There's also a 40 year old, very thin, large breasted. Very unattractive Caucasian woman who is homeless and her only possessions are trash bags that she uses for clothes, blankets, and and carrying devices. And everybody gives her, I think through pity and seniority, the lit semi-walled alcove that goes in and out of the utility shed, the Amtrak station, and the, the train yard, and down through the Caltran tunnel. Now, the whole time, the whole night, there was some insane creature that sounds male that is down in the Caltran tunnel howling like the damned. Wow. That's originally why I came out here because the, uh, the, the maintenance guy said, yeah, you can stay in here until midnight when we lock the doors. And then every hour, the, uh, the janitor, a young black guy goes down to the tunnel and max, and and mops up crazy juice down there while this thing howls like it's being attacked. Okay, I guess because its excretions are being mopped up. And the guy rolls his mop bucket back up to me, and he looks at me and shakes his head like, you don't want to be here for another two hours, yo. So I took the cue and I went outside. Now, uh, now, so that creature's howling the whole night long down in that, that tunnel. It's another reason to be outside, plus the weather was kind of pleasant. And uh, I was marginally chilly. If I'd have had my windbreaker, I would have been OK. If I didn't have my beard, I'd have probably froze to death. Right. So this uh, uh, this woman is asking if anybody's seen Tony, her husband in this red 74 Mustang. And young Jemima looks at how hot this white woman is. And she already knows I'm not interested in a woman. I'm just passing through. Because actually, the 35-year-old homeless chick, she was like a seven. She was cute. She was petite, only 95 pounds. Nice. She was going to be well-behaved. She was willing to be, you know, like essentially my, my wife, my homeless wife. Uh, and, of course, she had thrown her young self at me in all her vigor. Uh, so I wasn't anything that she was trying to defend. She was defending her recent sexual conquest of old school G. OK, the ashen faced dude who had this he had this great technique because sitting on the concrete is cold and he didn't want to be mistaken for a homo by asking to sit next to me on the old wooden bench and sitting on the concrete bench or steel bench. That's also cold. And all he's got on is a torn windbreaker. So what he would do is every hour he would go over to the gutter. He would place his gray handbag on the curb. He would sit on the gray handbag. And he would put his sneaker feet on the asphalt on the other side of the concrete gutter. And he'd lay back so that his body was only touching the gray handbag. And he'd keep warm that way. Well, this is the exact spot where Vanilla Trench is standing as the resident anthropologist who never says anything, but only lights cigarettes. And this woman comes up and she's ask, asking generally all of us, you know, this question. And young Jemima stands up and she's like, back the fuck off, bitch. Okay. <laughs> and, and this woman says, who are you talking to? I'm talking to you, bitch. How can you say that to me? Like this, bitch. Why are you saying that to me? Because you're a dumbass, bitch. Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> you want your ass whipped, bitch. <laughs> and then. The, the engineer from the train yard still sh starts yelling, girl fight, girl fight, you know, and then he's coming over to the fence to watch the fight. The black rabbit waves. Its feeding has been disturbed. And uh, to the rescue comes the resident anthropologist who breaks out her lighter. And because this girl's also asking for a smoke as he's asking where Tony, the guy with the 74 red Camaro is. OK, and then she gets her smoke wet and, and then the black, you know, 
uh, young Jemima says, you know, fuck you, you dumbass bitch, and your broke ass husband. <laughs> <laughs> he probably hasn't sold that. He probably hasn't sold that bitch ass card some homo getting his dick sucked right now. <laughs> you know, you know. So, so this this woman wanders away. Okay, after thanking this ant, resident anthropologist for a white. Okay, and I look to see if this woman ever writes anything down, and she doesn't. She looks at her papers. But she never writes anything down. So I'm like, maybe she's not like 30 years ago. I would have been at this bus stop, r- stop writing down behaviors. 20 years ago, I was doing it. OK, so I'm like, I wonder who this woman is. OK, so uh, then. At around 10 of and there's a bunch of other characters I'm not even describing here that come and go at at about 10 of three. This nymph comes out of the darkness from, I think it's Barack Obama way. It's like the main drag that goes in front of this place. Uh, she's short, maybe 5'2 to 5'4. She is wearing a full high-end fur coat with a hood and nothing else. Her shins, her legs are very nicely shaped, athletic, but soft. Her shins and calves are kind of sh- streaked with a sooty dirt, not soil, and not a deeply ground in old dirt. I'm mainly just looking at her legs because I'm worried she's coming close to me because I'm afraid if she's insane, she could kick my ass. Because she's obviously athletic and barefoot at night on the concrete and the asphalt. So I'm thinking whack job. Okay. Uh, and I, I don't want to have to like, fight a woman like she's a man and at my age and my small size an insane 25 year old chick that's on some kind of drug i mean you got to knock him out or something it's not like you can control him by yourself and not get bit all right so this chick comes up and everybody's looking and the men are all like i'm like oh my god this is like a nymph has just come out of the woods and, you know, the outcast from some ancient army, the camp followers, are just gazing on in admiration because she's highly attractive. She has brown hair, big magnetic blue eyes. She's pretty, I guess, you know, not fashion model pretty. She's like Marianne pretty from Gilligan's Island. OK. OK. Uh, and. She's got either a nice tan or she's like an octoroon, you know, very highly mixed. Like she's either like 10 to 20 percent African or she's just like tan. But her features are northern European, not Mediterranean. She's not from Spain, Italy, Greek, something like that. She's got a lot of an Irish, you know, Anglo-Irish look to her. Uh, Very attractive, you know, for for an English looking chick to even make a seven. You know, that's just beautiful. Okay, so. So this is, you know, that's the range normally. Normally it's a ground four for Mediterranean chicks, but that's kind of high for like Northwest European chicks. So uh, even though that's where I come from. So she comes up there and I'm expecting young Jemima to like chase her off as like the head hyena bitch of the clan here. Right. But she wants nothing to do with her. And that's saying something because young Jemima is like in the top 10 percent of female if they're going to throw down in a fight, I wouldn't want to fight her. I mean, that blowjob she put on old school, that almost killed him. Okay? <laughs> she must have held him down or something. I mean, I thought maybe he was being stabbed to death when I saw his feet kicking and everything. Okay. And he was like a six foot tall man. What fairly athletic. Okay. So, uh, so she was, and the Viking bitch says nothing, wraps her old man up in a hug. Like, Camellia, the vampire queen, is come out of the darkness and rolls him <laughs> into the gutter. She kicks him in the crack pipe. She actually kicks his meth pipe into his mouth and wraps him up in a blanket and rolls him into the gutter. Wow. And hides him from this bitch. Uh, the angry wigger, he hides back in the bushes. What the? Shirt head, he just leaves. The anthropologist, the resident anthropologist, 
this is when I find out that maybe she's an anthropology major that lost her mind during the vid and is just now a zombie. <laughs> she hides behind the bus shelter and shivers. What the fuck? Okay. Looking at this nymph, this beautiful woman coming. Okay. Uh, old school looks at her and licks his lips. Okay. Oh, wow. And I look at her and I was like, oh, my God. You know, I mean, I'm in the presence of a beautiful creature, but this is frightening. OK, I'm already afraid of this chick. And she's talking. To herself. No, she's not talking to herself. She's talking to an audience like a stage actor that is looking at us like just shadows in a darkened audience. <laughs> she's on the stage, right? <laughs> she's got her hands in her pockets and she says. Fuck. All I do is fuck. Fuck, 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 fuck. All I do is fuck. Is that all? Is there anything else? Was I ever anything else? It's like she's asking the audience. And I just looked away. I was like, oh, no, this woman has lost her mind. I could tell this is somebody searching for herself in, inside. And she's got a very attractive voice. Doesn't sound like she's ever smoked anything or ever screamed. She has standard English diction of the upper middle class educated variety she doesn't have a discernible accent not a valley girl jersey nothing can't tell an accent and she stops and she looks at the sky and she looks at this plane lifting off and she said who was i did i ever do anything but fuck i fuck all the time and then she looks at me but she's not seeing me it's like she's seeing like Somebody smoking a cigarette out in the audience or something. Uh, and then she says absently, like to an audience. I was somebody else before I drank the orange Kool-Aid. <laughs> Who was I? What did I do? And she's looking at the sky and she's kind of gracefully pirouetting around. She walks like a gymnast as she's preparing to attack the pummel horse. OK. That's how she does every step. Like she's a, she's a gymnast coming out to compete in some venue. How they kind of step with the front part of their foot, okay. like some kind of cat or something, with their body weight back, and very gracefully. So you could tell she has very strong hips. Just by the way, I couldn't step this way. The way she's stepping, with all her body weight back over her hips, and she's reaching out and she's like pulling herself forward with the balls of her feet. I was like, oh my god, this is like the reboot of the green alien chick from st from the original Star Trek, right? Wow. Uh, so she says to herself, I think I used to dance. I think I was a dancer. I should dance. Did I ever dance? Where did I dance? When did I dance? And she looks at the lit up area where trash bag woman sweeps in the corner, where the gates are closed to the various facilities. And she walks over there and I'm like, I want to watch her walk because I do not want this bitch coming up behind me. I've got my back as I'm facing out diagonally into this parking lot. My back is to a still in use aluminum phone shell, pay phone shell. And I don't want this bitch coming up behind me and put me in a rear naked or something. I mean, she looks really <laughs> athletic. Yeah. And I, I mean, it, the, the problem is with an insane chick, if she asks a man for his help and he denies her she might lose it right there okay so i'm afraid of that because people tend to see me and a nice old guy i'm gonna ask him for help you know uh but with you know i'm really afraid of insane chicks well and young jemima is terrified of this bitch she took one look at her and she just shook her head or oh hell no and she just walked back to the shelter where she blew old school and she curled up with her back to this chick like she was afraid to look at Medusa and just put her scarves over her head. All right. So everybody's terrified of this bitch, including me. It, uh, really, the only guy that it's not afraid of her is old school. He's like lusting after, you know, he's like, he's probably thinking, well, I just got raped by this big, young, scary bitch. I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't <laughs> mind getting killed by this chick. Right. So this girl walks back uh, with great poise to this lit area that's framed in brick arches and gates 
And uh, the trash bag woman is like huddling up and refusing to look at her. She's looking at the wall. So the subtext here is, okay, by most people that know me consider me to be marginally insane. Okay, like functionally, psychopathically insane. The crazies, everybody at this bus stop seemed to be mentally ill. They all regarded me as being also mentally ill, but the least mentally ill. Right. There are, you could tell that they're obviously sorting out a mental health hierarchy. With me, <laughs> with me uh, at one end of the spectrum, this bitch is at the other end of the spectrum. They are all terrified of her. I mean, visibly terrified of her. The most practical person is the black dude that's wondering if he's going to be able to get a blowjob out of this stuff. Okay. <laughs> all right. And uh, this young beauty goes under that. She's now framed in the light. The engineer in the train yard that wanted to see the worn out meth whore and the young black hoe get a fight, get into a fight. He didn't want to look at this woman anymore, as beautiful as she was, and he locked himself in the train. Wow. She says to herself, when she's looking up into nothing, because she's looking up into a searing, ceiling, she says, I should dance. <laughs> and in one motion, she reaches down, and she pulls off the fur coat. In one motion, she holds it taut over top of her with her front left leg extended and bent at the knee at 90 degrees and her back leg back and straightened out at 45 degrees okay and she's beautiful i mean she had is she naked she, now she was completely naked she had i mean i mean any guy worth his salt would elect her as the princess of the itty bitty titty how long is okay her how long because is her she hair? was built she was small breasted very athletic, but soft and rounded. I would say she was, without the coat on, she looked like she was 5'4". She's probably 5'4", 115, with extremely athletic, rounded hips. She looks like she should have been thrown over Conan the Barbarian's shoulder and on the cover of some comic book. Okay. Okay. When you saw her body and her poise, she became a 10. Okay. Yeah. Because she had her own style, everything fit. And I couldn't watch. I mean, I was, I was like, wow, she's beautiful. But, I mean, I just wanted to cry right then because you could see, like, psychologically, she's, like, somewhere beyond shattered. She's trying to figure out who she used to be. And then what's even worse is what happens next. Uh, I'm still afraid of her coming up behind me. So I glance over my shoulder, and she takes her coat. She folds it up. She holds it in front of her like a teddy bear. And now she starts walking like a lost toddler like a four-year-old girl. And I've seen this. There's a there's a little girl who's seven now who I've kind of been her surrogate grandfather for five years. I've seen her when she she just felt she was alone with me. I was I was taking her for a walk and for a moment she forgot I was there and she started wondering about where her father was and her father was in prison oh. and she was walking around in circles daydreaming about daddy 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 where's my daddy and i just wanted to cry listening to that right yeah. and that's how this girl was walking i've seen this girl when she was walking around holding a barbie dress wondering where the naked barbie was that it belonged to talking to the barbie in the shadows wherever her barbie was lost uh i've seen her uh i've seen her when she's lost some of her favorite lego pieces recently when she just turned seven years old, again, walking around lost, trying to think to herself, give herself memory cues. You know, where did I put the little pink Lego man? Uh, that's what I got out of this girl for another 15 minutes. She wanders around in these sorrowful little circles, looking at the sky and talking to something within her that she can't make contact with. Trying to get some clue as to who she was. And she didn't know, you know, and she had the tone. She had these little girl tones and her voice was musical. She talked to her herself kind of rhythmically. And it got to the point where the black guy shook his head and shook his shoulders like he was disgusted with himself and stopped looking at her like he had been hypnotized by her form. OK, 
probably the nicest looking butt I've ever seen in my life. Okay. Wow. You know, and I'm sure that's what he was saying. Like, oh, look at that ass, you know. But after a while, even that went enough. He's like, no, this is wrong. I can't even look at this shit. You know, like something or somebody just destroyed this young woman. Do you, you know, do, who knows? And, and then she walked out of our lives in the shadows. And then people slowly come out. It, it was like the marsupials coming out after T-Rex leaves the area, you know. Was she like, do you think she was like a normal person that got like sex trafficked and then went insane from being uh, fucked now, too much? I, I, I once, okay, I, I once protected a young woman who was a prostitute but sold herself. She had her own, she had her own uh, in-call business, okay? Okay. Okay, she never was on the street. She left L.A. because some black men abducted her, drugged her, and were going to pimp her out. And some other girl helped her escape, and they got away. And they went to the Pacific Northwest, and they set up their own. They trafficked themselves up there. They didn't want to be run by black men because it's really brutal. You know, it's like a one-way trip, you know. Uh, And... At one time, you know, black dudes have a sense for a vulnerable personality. And for somebody who's been trafficked once or abducted once, they know it's going to be easy to abduct them again. Uh, So this girl was waiting on a bus stop to actually go buy a truck because she was afraid to be on the bus stops. And some black guy pulled over, real big man, tried to force her into a car. And there's three white guys working at the auto zone on Powell Street who saw this. She had a knife. She was going to stab the black dude, but she was afraid that these three white guys were going to call the cops on her for stabbing the black dude. Fortunately, the black guy backed off because she convinced him that she was going to stab him. But she was mostly afraid that the white guys were going to call the cops on her for stabbing the would-be pimp that was trying to abduct her. Okay, so what she told me is what, you know, on the West Coast, you know, how girls are commonly trafficked because you got a lot of homegrown, attractive women who are like, the fatherless daughters of would be actresses or would be rock and roll stars or whatever. So you got a lot of good genetic material that's psychologically damaged. And it, the local tradition on in California is to abduct these girls, get them drugged up, like in that movie taken and then pimp them out. OK, who knows this girl to me, based on how what her education level and the fact that. This woman went through some kind of classical training uh, in gymnastics and dance. That costs a lot of money. That usually takes two parents. So my guess would be, if I had to guess, and it's only a guess, my guess would be she got abducted either by force or by fraud. You know, uh, I know a couple of girls and I've seen, well, I've seen two cases with young white men it, actually uh, taking their white girlfriends, J- two groups of black guys, to sell them. Against James, their- hold on one second. My grandma's yeah. calling me. Just hold. Okay. Sorry. Hold on one second. Hey, girl. Uh, no, remember it's from one to uh, eleven to one. Remember? Uh, yeah, maybe one. Okay. Okay. Let grandma talk to you in a little bit. Yeah. That's right. I'm gonna have to wrap it up in like ten. 15 minutes but but anyhow that sorry about that james that's right i'm gonna have to wrap it up in 10 or 15 minutes anyhow but i got run in my mouth but uh this, this is fascinating. I, I know women that that there's been various articles on my site where i've talked to women whose friends have been abducted who have had attempt attempt uh, attempted abductions i was witness to two attempted abductions, you know, I regularly walk by a place in Baltimore, which I'm going to see a week from now, where abducted women are held and trafficked and they're guarded by uh, one duty Baltimore City police officer. It's very common across the country. My guess would be this is a woman that had two parents just based on her physical education. I mean, unless she had a rich single mother, I don't see how she got this. You know, I watched. I've watched dozens of gymnastic competitions. It's one of the only things I can stomach in the Olympics when, when it's televised, when my mother watches it, you know, when I was younger. So I've watched a lot of these. This girl was a trained gymnast and a dancer. OK. And again, the, the little girl I know, Emma, she does both, though. She does dance 
and gymnastics. And she's been doing it for four years. And this girl's like at the level of them as teachers. Just wow. the few things I saw her do. It's always about the basics. And the basic stuff that this girl showed when he's trying to re- she's trying to rediscover who she is. This is, you know, this is expert level poise and basic pose and posture. OK, stuff that people would spend a couple of years just trying to learn that opening pose. And just the way she walks. So I would uh, I would hazard a guess that, yes, she was somehow abducted and it could have been by force or fraud, you know, and, uh, you know, it's fairly easy to do. You know, so I would. Uh, um, and then it's it ends on a good note after that, after she leaves at 310 at 330, I stand up, I, I stretch. Then I put my ruck on. I go over to the stop. And then the big black guy with the neon shoes, he stands up, gets ready to pack his stuff up because he knows the bus is coming and he's observing civic courtesy. He doesn't want to be in the way. And he looks at me and he picks up a pan of cr- can of Pringles. This is a six foot four, 320 pound athletic, 25 year old man. Clean, nicely dressed in that slovenly hip hop way with all these bright colors. They looks at me. Very clear standard diction. Sir, you see this mouth on this can. It's the Pringles can. And it's a version that has the mouth of the Pringles character open really wide. He says, doesn't that remind you of the old school zombie movies from back in your day when the thing that was scary about the zombie was the yawning hunger instead of like the, the tearing fingernails and teeth? <laughs> he said, but I believe in always starting the day the right way with a prayer. And then he picks up the can. He uses it like a microphone. And I can't remember songs. I'm just not a musical person. He does a song and dance that's about five minutes long. He sounds really good. He's belting out these tunes, not in Barry tone, but like the next one down, whatever that is. Not Barry White, but the next step back. He's even doing spins and stuff like that, doing a a whole show. And he spins around. And when he's done, he looks at me. And, you know, he said, you got to call in the dawn with a smile, sir. You got to start the day happy and you have a wonderful day, sir. Would you like this can? I shook my head no. And he sat it down respectfully. Then he bundled up his stuff and he went on his way as the bus was pulling up. You know, I mean, and that's just like a totally abridged version. I I had to spend three days writing this up. Wow. You know, I, I mean, but it was really just and this is the refugee island of the insane homeless people, because none of these people were violent. Two of them pretended to be. The one angry Wager and young Jemima, but none of these people were violent. They were all escaping worse circumstances, more violent people. And, uh, you know, it was sad. Yeah, it's sad, but like very fascinating and and hilarious at times. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it was just... Wow. Yeah, you know, it, it, it was literally crazy. But, you know, it reminded me of, uh, you know, like various uh, like aboriginal people uh, regard the insane as taboo. And and they they don't even want to harm them. You know, like modern people, medicalized people. A lot of us like to harm insane people. Usually in a controlled medical setting, but we like to harm them. I mean, we have some of the largest corporations in the world dedicated to harming mentally ill people, Uh, you know, and if just to make money off them, not for sadistic purpose, but for money making purposes. But primitive people and I guess essentially these insane people that weren't in an institution, they were like feral primitives. When somebody crazier than them came around. It was like the leopard and the jaguar leaving when the lion when the lion shows up, you know. Yeah. What that would this that this will probably be a question for another episode, but it would be interesting to know like what um clan clan and tribal societies how they would deal with someone that like was schizophrenic or something like that. Would they become a shaman or? Oh yeah, a, yeah that's an easy one. Yeah, and the uh and. And, and first of all, they're very rare. You know, right. our society makes these people at such a high rate that, uh, and indeed, what the next one we're going to do is going to be on disease, right? And that should include drugs, 
because that's like our biggest disease right now. Okay. Uh, you know, and, and there's, of course, there's a connection there. And I guess this could kind of be a preamble for that. Uh, but our society generates insane people at such a degree that you can't sanctify them and make them special and give them a status spot. I see what you're saying. Unless it's their own, yeah. their only little street corner, in which case they're, you know, you just, you don't have enough room of them. I mean, we now have 10% of the population off their rocker. <laughs> okay. You know, 60% of women are only functional because they're taking massive amounts of anti-anxiety and anti-depression medications. And they're taking, and they're engaged in physical therapy and psychotherapy. Okay. So, I mean, what, the, what we have, 60% of our population is functionally insane. Okay. You know, and we probably got 30% that's not even functional. They're, they're on various stages of, you know, disability, even if it's, it, it's just crazy. And then you got, like, the people that are just so dysfunctional that they're homeless. But, yeah, so they were, it, I think it's normal for people to have a set-aside position of some value for the insane person. Because crazy people see stuff that sane people don't see. For instance, these people immediately, it was the two least insane guys there that didn't get the message with this chick right away. Me and old school. The total, cra you know, the crazier people, they got right away that this chick was stepping off another planet. Yeah. She was gone. Okay. They, did, they, they felt it. Okay. So, so yeah. So, it's... It's humanly abnormal in a pre-civilized setting to mistreat the insane or to punish the insane. Yeah, speaking of punishing the insane, just <laughs> I was watching this um, uh, police clip and um, this demented woman, she stole something from like Home Depot, like a flower, and she was like 75. And this cop, he like basically like, tackled her handcuffed her um and um scruffed her up a little bit and then like back at the station um they were like i don't know how i guess there was there was a camera inside the station i can send you the link you can watch it yourself but like they're all in their little police station these these pieces of shit and they're making fun of how they like tackled and abused this demented like literally demented old lady for shoplifting and then the lady's uh, daughter sues sues them and and got some money. I mean, most people aren't able to do that, but well, that's yeah. a devolution of you know. Now you're using the person for entertainment, yeah, for your own nihilistic elevation and their negation, which go hand in hand. Uh, in a way, maybe that's the bottom stair of devolution from having them be the shaman that maybe uh communicates with beyond for you on your behalf you know uh in their cave you know outside of normal human habitation you know maybe that's where this finally devolves to when we've reached uh we've we finally entered the nil and we've reached a purely nihilistic society because our society is largely based on negation which is you know a key mechanic of uh, that results in the end in nihilism. Uh, so, you know, I, I think it all comes together as part of it. And, uh, uh, I, I wrote on this in the novel uh, uh, by Gaslight, which was a lot about mental health and transcendence, and it was set in Portland. Okay. okay. That's and again, it was two characters based on myself, and I wrote this while homeless and my host who had been homeless for eight years. So I interviewed him about his life when he was homeless. And the conceit of this novel by Gaslight was that we are two souls that are bound together by a curse. And that he was homeless between age 15 and 22. And that I became homeless at 56. So what if, we were transmigrant souls that knew each other in another time and were killed together. And we were magnetically drawn to reunite 
And when I became homeless at 56, I met him in his last year of homelessness at 22. So we have my host in Portland, who's now 45. We have him in his yet last year of homeless, homelessness when he was 22, when he came to Portland. And me in my first year of homelessness when I was 56, when I came to Portland. And he had come to Portland after a caper in which he stole musical equipment. And his nickname was Tones, as in the tone of the musical instrument. He actually gets caught up in Seattle with a bunch of stolen musical equipment from a guitar store. OK, uh, it's a caper he did when he was homeless. And I came to Portland right after I had, uh, I had had my books banned and I was really broke. Well, if I wasn't me, if I was a guy that had just quit his job and wrote his first couple books and got his books banned, I would have been doxxed. So uh, the subtitle of the article was uh, The Quixotic Fate of Alias Dox and Tones. So these are our aliases, but we were really too, uh, we were too, really, we were too runaway Irish conscripts in the British Army. They ended up uh, pairing up with Sir Richard Francis Burton in Argentina because he disappeared in the wilds of Argentina for six months during that period, during the War of the Triple Alliance, with two uh, men that people thought were Americans and went off into the wild and then six months later just appeared in uh, Lima, Peru. So what I have happened to start the story is Burton goes on a quest to Cusco and he's with these two guys as his servants. He threatens to send them back to the British army, but promises to get them passage to America if they help him out and they rebel at the last minute and he kills them both. But what he does is he, as they're dying, he binds their wounds, the cut wounds. So that they'll die slowly <laughs> because he uses his sword on them when they come at him with daggers. Uh, he, uh, he cuts both of their wrists, and as they're dying, he binds their wounds, and he has these uh, these two local shaman have them drink ayahuasca, and oh, wow. he casts their skull their souls into the future in search of the Hindu uh, Hindu uh, priest who has been haunting his nightmares. So th- basically, what I wrote in real time, describing whether day by day what happened, was my host and I as two homeless guys that would revert into our subconscious into hunting people who were in the human trafficking business in hopes of finding this ancient Hindu priest and cutting their head off and taking the head to Mount Hood for Sir, for Sir Captain Richard Francis Burton. Wow. So it's a really weird horror novel that's based around train travel and homelessness. And most of the scenes were real scenes that I experienced. And some of them were even scenes I experienced with my friend. And all I did was add the killings. This sounds like a like a Cthulhu role playing yeah. adventure. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's called by gaslight, you know, and, oh. uh, and well, anyways, it, it's it's part of that. It's part of that whole thing about uh, how postmodern insanity does a full cyclic loop back to shamanism, because now you got people going homeless and starting their own. Uh, neo-tribal cultures and engaging in their own psychedelic shamanic activity. Wow. That's, that's really interesting. Well, I think, um, would you like to end it now? Um, I'm having a great time. I just, I got to go with my, grandma. Oh yeah, I, I, I have to go too. I've got to take a drive over uh, the Appalachian mountains with none other than Mr. Mescaline Franklin. That sounds like an adventure. Um, it's been great talking with you, James. Uh, and we'll, um, we'll do we'll do this soon. Um, and I'll send you the the link um, on Skype and everything. Sure, and then I'll wake up with it. That that has been working out perfect. Thank you so much, young man. Uh, sorry for ranting so much, but uh, no, it was great. That was a fascinating story. Yeah, yeah, it was just, uh, yeah, it was a bunch of other stuff. It'll all show up in my writing uh, posting in December of 2023 is when these articles are scheduled to post. But there's a bunch of other stuff that was on there. 
you know, including an African American conservative, outspoken super soldier, ex Marine, who was lecturing liberal progressives on why black lives don't matter. Was this on the train or at the homeless place? And they were all, you had homos, lisping, lisping homo advocates for the homeless. You had, uh, you had a uh, hipster and lesbian and straight and married and single, uh, millennials and zoomers, uh, and boomers worshiping this guy all Caucasians totally worshiping this guy who was a stud big he, he looked like he kind of looked like a little bit like a cross between Batista and the rock <laughs> okay and he was literally holding court telling people where they could sit where they can't sit <laughs> leave that you're sitting too close to that lady you invade her space you invade my space and the lisping faggot homo was like but i wanted to sit closer to you and he's like back back you know in your place <laughs> you know <laughs> and then the woman who's a feminist who doesn't want anybody to help her with her baggage is like oh thank you so much for defending my for defending my space you're like you're like a knight <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was great. I mean, I couldn't have made this shit up. You know, it was like <laughs> this guy descended out of a, a PC comic book from the future. You know, <laughs> we can do the next episode. We can we can if you have more stories about this, we, we can just continue it. And then no, you- uh, let's, I did a ton of it in my writing. OK, you know, by okay. the time I'm done writing the rest of it, I'm going to be sick of it. Okay? OK, and it's out there. You know, it'll be in my writing at the end of this year. OK. Uh, but uh, I'd, I'd rather do the historical stuff because I can pull this stuff out and I promise I will. I'll reference some of this stuff, new stuff, like in with the historical stuff. I'll try to keep like interweaving like recent stuff that like happened yesterday, last week, last month with like stuff that Thucydides or Herodotus wrote about. That'll be easy. OK, that's so great. I promise I'll do that. I want to shit can it. All right. Because I know it's entertaining. <laughs> I, Kurt. No, it's great, man. It's great. Um, hey, bro. Yeah. Oh, uh, I'll put on the, the the ending music. Um, yeah. Little tidbit thing I wanted to say real quick about that demented lady. Um, the only uh, person that kind of like defended her, at least just verbally, this this Mexican guy, and he he sound, he, he sounded like a Mexican from Mexico, like oh, he's his a traditional ass- person. <laughs> like like he had like a he he was in a like a actually a somewhat decent truck so it seemed like he was doing some type of hustle maybe he had a, a trade I, I don't know but he was he sat there and respectfully he didn't yell or anything but he bantered and with uh the cop saying you know like this isn't right what you're doing <laughs> And the, and the like the cop the cop was like she stole she she committed theft you know like, it was just yeah it was it was crazy the English priest that got a hold of Joan of Arc right <laughs> okay what is uh, best in okay let me let me find what is best in life here one second uh where uh, uh, thank you. Thank you.